All right, it's Father Francis, the Faith Guy, with another drive-by homiletic reflection on this, the 21st Sunday at Ordinary Time. I think our readings today talk to us about the importance of a moral code. Now, they may not be, morality may not be explicitly stated in these readings, but I do believe that underneath these ideas in these readings, there is, it points to the reality, again, of a universal moral code. Our first reading from Isaiah, it tells us that peoples of every language will see the glory of God. And when we think of the glory of God, we think of something that's good. If we think of something that's good, we think of something that's truthful. And certainly something that's truthful is based in morality. It's a standard that we can all say, yes, this is good, this is truthful, this is moral. Our second reading talks to us about not despising the discipline of the Lord. Again, a standard is imposed upon us, and sometimes we measure up to that standard and sometimes we don't. Again, this implies a moral standard. And finally, the gospel. When his disciples asked Jesus, um, who are to be saved? Are all people to be saved, or is it a small few, select few? And he says, try and enter by the narrow way. Again, one who is a disciple follows a way. And again, that implies a moral code. Now you're probably wondering, well, why am I talking about a moral code? Why am I trying to, in any ways, uh, tease out a moral theme from our readings this weekend? Well, it has to do with what happened here in California on August 4th, 2010. Judge Von Walker declared that the controversial proposition, Proposition 8, is unconstitutional. And with his uh, judgment came great rejoicing and dancing in the streets of San Francisco. And do I dare say it, everyone was happy and gay? Well, surely not everyone. What I find so surprising is that Judge Walker said that he was not going to hear a moral-based argument against same-sex marriage. It would be like in a murder trial as the prosecuting attorney is beginning to bring forth evidence uh, against the accused for a heinous crime and he's saying, Your Honor, the evidence will show that the accused took this knife and wielded it against the victim. And all of a sudden Jeb says, Excuse me, excuse me. I'm not going to allow that testimony or these facts or this evidence into this courtroom. <laughs> you, you, excuse me? Everyone would go, but wait a minute. You're trying to bring proof that this person did this crime. And now you're not going to hear the evidence. And so now how else are you going to be able to prove your case? Well, you can't. That's the bottom line. That's the point. You can't. And so when Judge Walker said, I'm not going to hear any more any more." moral-based arguments against same-sex marriage give me another reason. Well, he effectively basically took away the only argument that people had against same-sex marriage based on a moral, uh, ethical uh, standpoint. Many people shake their heads in unbelief. How could this be? And as they scratch their heads in disbelief, they begin to look around for somebody to blame. Naturally, a lot of people would like to blame the homosexual community. Again, because of their militant agitating to radically define the definition of marriage. And yet, I have to say that I don't blame the homosexuals. I really think the group that needs to be blamed are Christians. That's right. You heard me correctly. I think that the, the main group that bears most of the blame are Christian groups. Let me explain. Remember this guy? Back in the 1600s, I think it's safe to say that most people would agree that the standard definition of marriage was between a man 
and a woman for life until death do they part and the moral reasoning behind that it was so that they could bring forth uh, new life family procreation so again I guess most people would be in agreement in the 16th century that marriage was again a, uh, a covenantal sacramental relationship between a man and a woman one man one woman for life until death do you part to bring forth a family that would be I think safe to say that that was the that would be considered the, the standard definition there would be there would there would would not even enter into the minds of people any other definition than that one and so as a re, as a result of Henry's uh, marriage to Anne Boleyn in 1533 and also after Henry divorced himself from the authority of the Roman Catholic Church he became the sole authority of marriage laws in England and so he could marry whoever whenever he chose and his marriage to Anne Boleyn created a precedent shall we say now this precedent um, lay dormant for about mm, three centuries and it was finally fanned into flame in the 20th century now I am sure without a doubt that many people who are watching this video right now are going to say ah he's going to blame the the sexual revolution of the 1960s not at all actually what happened uh, the real radical changes began actually in the 1930s and here's what happened some uh, mainline Protestant groups began to you know I guess ask questions and say well wait a minute if a person can be you know in the case of Henry the eighth and his six wives uh, could be married and then divorced well then maybe people can be married and divorced and remarried again maybe many times and so what happened was the definition of marriage begins to change radically and so instead of it being again uh, a marriage a sacramental union between one man and one woman for life uh, until death do you part now now you can get married divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried and divorced and you know, hey. So the definition changes radically. The definition later changes in the 1950s when uh, birth control becomes economical and personal and convenient in the form of the pill. And so now you don't have to be married and have kids if you don't want them. So, you don't want a family? Don't have to have one. Just take your little pill. Or some other of the newer modern uh, contraceptives. So again, now the definition of marriage changes yet again. So if instead of a marriage being between a man and a woman for life, to bring forth a family, hey, you don't even have to have the family. Also, believe it or not, the definition of marriage was also challenged uh, in by some other groups who decided that it would be okay to introduce uh, multiple marriage. Do I dare say it? Polygamy. Now, although that was never uh, uh, legislated into law, there are some groups who still believe that that is uh, a God-ordained ordinance and practice that. We come now to the judge's rendering of August 4th, 2010, so is it any wonder the judge was not able to hear a moral argument against same-sex marriage? In other words, he couldn't find a consistent moral standard to say, aha, everybody agrees that this is what the definition of marriage is. Because again, the definition of marriage had been altered many times and changed over the, the last century. So there wasn't a consistent moral standard with which to judge. And so that is why I believe Judge Walker uh, basically said, sorry, don't try and bring me any moral arguments, essentially because there really isn't one, not a consistent one. 
So, as a result, Bob, Carol, Ted, and Alice now have a plethora of marriage options, don't they? Bob with Ted, Carol with Alice, and in the future we can see little Billy uh, joining with Ted, or Carol, or Alice, or Bob, or little Susie with, you know, Carol and Alice, or Bob and Ted. And let's not forget John. John can marry all of them. Well, not anymore. And who knows, we may even in the future hear about a man who decides to marry his cat. And that's all I'm going to say about that. And so I lament in this particular homiletic reflection that the moral voice has, sad to say, been silenced. And the reason why it has been silenced is because it had been tampered with uh, for the last, at least the last few centuries. Um, and I think another reason why the moral standard has also fallen on hard times is simply because people in our country do not uh, abide hip- hypocrisy. Unfortunately, just because an individual is a hypocrite doesn't mean that the rules which they have been trying to follow are untrue. A lot of people in our culture today love to point out the the foibles and the the misdeeds of religious people or possibly self-righteous people and say, aha, see, they're nothing but hypocrites. And sad to say, there are a lot of hypocrites. Uh, I have to consider myself in that group. But just because somebody, let's say, uses mathematics to cheat the government, or they find a formula and they are able to, uh, say, go into a gambling casino and basically cheat the house, doesn't mean that mathematics is untrue. The principles of behind mathematics are untrue. Just because an individual is not able to live up to a certain moral standard does not mean that that moral standard is somehow uh, bankrupt or untrue. So sadly, Judge Walker was not able to hear a moral argument simply because there was not a consistent moral argument for him to hear. It had been tampered with a long time ago. Now we see multiple definitions of marriage. This is a cause for great concern. It should be a cause for great concern for all of us. Because if the definition of marriage can be radically altered, what about the definition of murder? You know, supposing in my understanding or my definition, it's okay to murder certain people. And you might say, well, that's ridiculous. Everybody agrees what murder is, and it's all wrong. It's always wrong. Everybody agrees on that one. Do they? Isn't it interesting that thousands upon thousands of innocent people are murdered every day, all under the name of convenience, and everyone accepts it? Again, the definition has changed. And you might say, oh, you're being fantastic. That's ridiculous. That doesn't happen. But it does happen every day at places called Planned Parenthood and other uh, abortion clinics. Innocent little babies are murdered uh, because people have changed the definition of what murder is and what murder isn't. So again, this is the sad conclusion when we begin to alter the voice of morality. This has been Father Francis with another drive-by theological reflection. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, and until next week, keep on keeping on.